thank you uh, so much. I should say uh, good afternoon or uh, good evening, depending on which you prefer. Uh, my name is Sean Donnan, and I'm the World Trade Editor for the Financial Times, and it is my distinct privilege, I'm very excited about this, uh, to be here this evening with a man who I would argue is one of the most civilized uh, gentlemen in the global economy. <laughs> That's good. And probably one of the wisest uh, as well. Uh, Kamal uh, Dervish, as you all know, is, of course, a vice president here at Brookings and director uh, of the Global Economy and Development Program. He was formerly head of the United Nations Development Program, as he was just telling me the wonderful story of the different political reactions to, uh, to him leaving Turkey to go take that job uh, some years ago. Um, he was also, of course, uh, Minister of Economic Affairs of, uh, of Turkey, and he needs uh, very little introduction. I'm, uh, it's, there are many times in this town when you are handed a book that someone has published um, when you, uh, you dread it slightly. Um, the, uh, uh, there are plenty of earnest tomes in this town uh, and uh, tomes that uh, survey a wide landscape and, and, and don't offer very much new. And I'm very happy to report that this is not one of them. Uh, for years, Kamal has contributed a monthly column to Project Syndicate, uh, which in appropriate fashion, I think, is published in several languages. Yes. Um, and we are here this evening to talk about his new book, which is a collection of those essays from 2012 to 2015, and called Reflections on Progress. Uh, and perhaps we should reflect on progress uh, this evening and, and, and exactly where we are as we look out uh, on the political landscape around us and, 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 and around the world, and we'll do a bit of that uh, this evening. But I think it, it's, a, it's a remarkable book in, in one big way, which is these are essays that have been written over the last three years, Kamal, and as I said to you earlier, uh, each one of the titles of these essays uh, would be relevant uh, today. And in fact, many of these essays, even some that were written several years ago, uh, are really relevant commentary uh, on the scene around this uh, today. So I think uh, before we go any further, I think we need to liven things up and, and, and we need a round of applause for that achievement uh, in itself. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk for, for about half an hour or so, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open things up to the to floor, and uh, I hope you will have some, some, some wise questions for Kamal. Uh, Kamal, I, I thought I would really begin where you begin in your preface, uh, and you talk in there about a uh, strong belief in continuous human progress and that being one of the great legacies of the Enlightenment. That's uh, is one of your first sentences. Uh, and then you go on very quickly to offer what feels like a warning at this point. You say, here we go, angry populism and astonishing forms of nihilism are spreading. At the same time, authoritarianism and the cult of the leader can be seen gaining momentum in many places, offering a dubious solution to the fear of the future felt by large segments of the world's population. And now sitting here in Washington, that feels incredibly relevant, but I would argue it feels incredibly relevant in the UK as well, perhaps even in Turkey, uh, your home country there as well. You also ominously talk about what you see as the binding constraint on future progress. And that is uh, our ability, essentially, to get along with each other, either between governments or social groups. Expand on that for me. Thank you very much, Sean. It's, it's, it's a, I, I really wa wanted to start by, by this point, and you, you allow me to do that. And um, just two, two quick, very quick stories. I was 16 in a boarding school and kind of thinking about life and studying philosophy and literature and all that. And I almost had a religious moment in terms of the Enlightenment. Okay. I was reading the various French philosophers, English philosophers, American philosophers, and so on. And I kind of realized, hey, by using reason and being reasonable, <laughs> actually most problems can be solved. And, and, and I, 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 I distinctly remember it was a very enjoyable experience. Uh, 
And then some months later, I read Stefan Zweig's The World of Yesterday, mm. which was one of the pieces in the book. Not all of you, obviously, uh, need to know Stefan Zweig. He, he was a very, um, in his time, well-known Austrian, German writing, Jewish religion, intellectual and, um, and wonderful, uh, I think, political philosopher. And, and he lived, as a young man, the incredible progress which he, you know, he describes mm -hmm. of the late 1900s and the early 20th century, where everything seemed to be progressing. I mean, there, there was poverty, there was inequality, Marxism. I mean, I don't want to exaggerate. Everything was not hunky-dory. But there, there was a, a, a strong sense that you know, the world had really decided on progress. And then everything fell apart, particularly for Stefan Zweig, an Austrian, Jewish, German writer. I mean, disaster of World War I, where, I mean, what kind of reasonable is it, reasonableness is it, when hundreds of thousands of people are gunning each other down in trenches? And then, by the way, I think for two years, they decide this is not a good thing to do at Christmas and actually interrupt and have a joint Christmas celebration. I mean, I mean th that's a very nice thing, but when you, when you really think about it, it's almost unthinkable. I mean, if you can have a <laughs> Christmas celebration together, why on earth are you gunning yourself down? It's enlightened, but not wholly rational. <laughs> that's right. So with these two stories, I, I, I kind of translate the tension I always feel in myself a strong belief in progress, in reason, in rationalism, in the Enlightenment in its various forms. Um, but at the same time, and my mother was born in Berlin, that may have something to do with it, a, a, a very deep fear of very bad things that can happen and have happened. Not thousands of years ago, but fairly recently, things one can hardly imagine. So, I mean, you know, that tension, I think, comes, uh, comes in the book. It's a more philosophical point. Mm. I, we have more economics to, to discuss. But I guess my bottom line is that we've never won the battle. We've never, you, you made, paid me a great compliment, civilized. <laughs> I like that. Nobody actually has ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> Civilization has never won. You know, uh, it hasn't won today in the, in the Middle East, in, in the banlieues, in, in, in France, in some parts of this country even. It's a constant battle for civilization. And I think at the core of that constant battle is more uh, attempt and effort at governance, at getting along, at finding ways to communicate and compromise, rather than a lack of pure technology or a lack of pure financial resources. I believe at this point we're in a point in history, or one of the points in history, where we probably have huge amounts of technology all over the place coming from everywhere on us. Most of it very admirable. And many things can be done with this technology. We also have, I think, the American big corporations alone are sitting on 1.8 trillion dollars of profit, if I'm not mistaken. Sean, you, you know these figures by heart. I, I don't. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> and you know, we have huge amount of financial resources, savings that are actually available, but that somehow don't get channeled into the most. Um, what would appear to the greatest needs and greatest, even the greatest returns. So that's, in a way, uh, the core of many of these things. And, and, and I'm happy to bring it out under Brookings with Valentina having supported it, because Brookings has chosen as its second, anniversary, uh, second hundred anniversary mm -hmm. theme, good governance. 
You're fairly optimistic throughout this book. I mean, there, there's, a, there's at least a strand of optimism uh, through there. There's occasional moments where you're less sunny. Um, but the, um, do you feel like we're, we're still progressing? Do you feel like we're running out? To be on, on this question, I would say I was quite sure that we were, we were progressing on the whole maybe until three, four years ago. Now, for the first time in my entire life, I have some doubts that we will actually progress in the sense of civilization, in the sense I think, Sean, you meant it and I'm, I mean mm. it. Uh, of course, there's going to be technological progress. You know, it's, uh, the form it takes may create problems, but it will advance our capacity to organize things, to increase potential prosperity, and so on. Education. Uh, there, is also, there has also been a lot of progress in, in the developing countries. My dear co-manager, cohort, and friend, Homi Haras, always reminds me of that because he's the hyper-optimist among us. How many hundreds of millions of people have come out of poverty mm -hmm. over the last decade. So these are things one cannot minimize in any way. But um, at the same time, uh, you know, civilizational progress is, is, is not assured un un unless we, f we find ways to manage our conflicts and our potential hatreds and so on. I got very involved in the Bosnian question when I was at the World Bank. And it's, it again reflects identity politics, I'm, I'm afraid, in a bad way for mm. me. Mm. Because I was sad when many other people were killed and massacred throughout the world. I'm being very honest. This is a time in, a, in life I think one has to be very, very, very honest, you know. And much worse things happened than in Bosnia, in Africa, in Cambodia, in, in other places. But to be honest with you, I had bad dreams about it. But it didn't prevent me from sleeping many nights. Hmm. Bosnia gave me insomnia. insomnia. Hmm. Why? Because from an identity politics point of view, from the person... I grew up to be from the civilizational influences and cultural influences that bear on me, it was very close. It was as if my world was actually being the Sarajevo. Right. I, I, I viewed a little bit as my city, as Ident an Ottoman, yeah. as a European Ottoman Turk. And I, I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. So even somebody who, as global and as hopefully, you know, open to all human suffering in the world, has these, what I would call, certain weak spots, because we, we get mobilized for certain things and not mobilized as much for, for other things. And in, in each of us, there lurks the danger of identity politics and, I hope, never in myself, identity fanaticism, but identity, an excessive kind of Right. Identitism. You talk about being a <laughs> European Ottoman Turk. You talk about the danger of identity politics. Uh, identity politics are, are something that's very strong right now right. in Turkey. Absolutely. How should we read that from here? Well, uh, that's... <laughs> I purposely didn't write this book on Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> but many of the themes are relevant. Um, the founder of the Republic whom I consider an Ottoman European Turk, wanted to create a republic. I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not saying he did it perfectly, where someone, some, when somebody asked him, well, what, what is a Turk? You know, the Turks were not, they, they were calling themselves Ottomans when they were asked for the nationality before. Mm. It was a kind of funny ethnic concept. And because of the disasters, you know, that befell the Ottoman Empire, he said, well, anybody who is a Turkish citizen is a Turk. And that reminds me very much of America. 
anybody who's an American citizen is American. And um, it's not always applied. And certainly in history, it was not always applied, neither in the Ottoman Empire nor in, in, in America. But, um, but I think that's the opposite of identity politics in, a, in an ethnic or religious sense. The question is, it is not sufficient when the nation becomes the identity, however diverse it may be. Mm -hmm. Americans may feel extremely diverse, and they are. And that's the great strength of this country. Um, when that turns into a strange kind of um, bad feeling towards people who have who want to immigrate two or three generations after themselves, <laughs> it becomes you know very yeah. strange, yeah. and yet it happens. So uh, we, 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 we don't have a global community. We see that in the G20. We see that in the, in the, in the global economics. Uh, we don't have the emotional, ideological counterpart to the global economy. We have a global economy. I think it's very much more global than it ever was. Mm -hmm. The interdependence, the spillover effects, they may not be linear the speed with which things happen, everything has tremendously made this economy more global. But have we really become a more global community? And where are we heading? Um, that is obviously a big question nowadays. That is the, uh, that is the big We see politics uh, intruding in some ways uh, in, in globalization, or globalization becoming one of the big uh, discussion points in, 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 in politics. Brexit in June, uh, the vote there seen as a, as a kind of vote to pull back from globalization. Uh, you in here have this, this great sweep of history. You point out that the world economy is something that was born uh, around the time of the Roman Empire, the Han Dynasty, but that globalization in its current form is really something that's only been with us since 1990 yeah. or so. Um, and everywhere I look, including the pink pages of the Financial Times, where Martin Wolf was writing about this last week, um, it looks like everyone's bemoaning um, the end of that era or uh, yeah, Martin a has threat become to that. Fairly uh, pessimistic. Yes, it's um, yeah, yes. I get some dark emails from Martin nowadays. But the um, <laughs> um, the um, how do you view it? I think at the end of the day, that may sound very. Um, geographically partial in a way, but because of the Enlightenment and because of where things came from, a huge amount will depend on a, on a few countries, mm. a few big countries. The U.S. is being one of them. I mean, I've written articles, not in this book. The U.S. is a microcosm of globalization. Mm -hmm. It has links to all parts of the world, to Africa, it has a very vibrant, strong Jewish community. It has also a strong Arab and Muslim community now. A very bo a big Indian, uh, Pakistani community, very successful. Mm. Of course, the Hispanics and, and so on. And if the U.S. takes this diversity and transforms it into a great asset of leadership, of how to handle all these things and... and I think the leadership it can, it can exert is, is huge. The other thing I want to talk about Europe, but maybe come back yeah, to we'll that come a back little to bit Europe. later. Yeah. And then the big Asian countries are very important too, particularly in my, case, in my view, India. Yeah. I mean, India is one of the most spectacular democracies we've experienced. With, I forgot the number of languages, but it's over a thousand, no? And major different religions, and, it, and there's never been real military coups or you know, elections are fought, there's corruption, there's this and that, and then it somehow democracy works. Right. And some give all the credit to the British. The British may deserve a little bit of credit, but it was so way before the British. 
uh, you know, and, and when, when some of the rulers of India assembled their advisors around them, they were very inclusive. So in, India has that inclusive, uh, inclusive history. A lot will depend on that. I think a lot will also depend at the end of the day on globaliz the, the, the way globalization hang handles inequality. Sweet. Because this is one of the big issues now, which we'll is why it's the second part of the book. It's the second part of the book. We'll get to inequality in just one second. I want to get there via convergence, which you spent a lot of time talking yep. about. You're very confident in this book that convergence is a kind of inevitable course, and yet you, you also quote this wonderful uh, uh, anecdote from the late 1950s in which a lot of uh, at a time when a lot of Western economists, eminent Western economists, I think you call them, uh, believed that because uh, the Soviets could put a spacecraft, uh, after they put their first spacecraft uh, into orbit, uh, they, uh, many were arguing that within a matter of just a few decades, the Soviets would overtake uh, the U.S. in terms of income simply because they were investing 40% of GDP. Uh, at the time. There is a, a, a certain element that, that rings familiar uh, to those of us who have read all of those predictions about China uh, in the future, that by 2050 or 2060 it'll, it'll overtake um, uh, the U.S. or catch up with the U.S. Uh, and yet at the same time we've got the World Bank pointing out that as economies slow, as they did this summer, they were pointing out that actually a lot of emerging economies are, are, are falling back again behind that. Are you still confident that convergence is, 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 is a, is it's, a it's relentless one? It's, it's an excellent and heart-hitting question. I was more confident four years ago than I am now, which is reflected in the <laughs> nuances of the articles. The convergence that was predicted between the Soviet economy by no, no other than Samuelson <laughs> Uh, was based on the kind of basic Harold Domar growth model where capital output ratios were fixed. And if you inv invest more capital, even if you're, output, if you're inefficient and your capital output ratio is higher, at the end of the day, you know, by, by the accumulation of more capital, uh, you will overtake. And I remember a sentence and saying, but that will never make them democratic. So the, so in my question, in, in my mind, then I ever had well, a, a Soviet Union that's more powerful but less democratic. Is that going to be isn't a real problem? Right. You know, the convergence that the articles in the book are discussing, and more, a, a wider group of economists are discussing, oversimplifying. And to my very ac academic economic friends, I am a a big oversimplifier, but without that you can't reach, as you know, <laughs> the masses, yes. the yes. interested masses of citizens and, 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 and people interested in that, is about technology and the ability by institutions and people to absorb that technology and to learn it. And there I think we have a much more powerful channel of convergence that has shown itself. With maybe this question mark about institutions, which brings us back to governance. Uh, if governance completely falls apart, then maybe that, you know, that absorption of technology will significantly slow down. It is amazing when you take a random selection of 10 writers writing on this, Ten years ago, five years ago, during the height of the economic crisis, or, or six years ago, emerging <laughs> markets could do no wrong. Mm. It was the new nirvana. Mm -hmm. You know, it was growth rate differential was going to be either four percent or five percent or six percent, and this was taken as basic knowledge. Then about, I mean, I like the economist hate to say something against The Economist, but about 18 months ago, uh, they wrote that article basically saying, end of emerging market, boom. I, don't, I can't remember exactly yeah, yeah. how it handled it, you know. And so uh, 
the world has changed. One of the important points that Danny Roderick makes um, is that manufacturing was, in manufacturing it was much easier right. to catch up, whereas in services it's not. And I accept that and more difficulty. But up to a point only, because the dividing line between mar manufacturing and services has become not so easy to draw. I mean, you have many iPads somewhere in this room, I'm sure. What is that product? A service product or a manufacturing product? You know, the coding is all services. Um, so coding, if coding can go quickly to developing countries in a, in a well done way, I'm not sure the convergence might not be in that sense as quick as in manufacturing. I don't quite agree with Danny in, in his pessimism on the slowdown. In the institutions, there I agree more with him. The kind of political maturity and the political know-how and institutional kind of character, uh, there, there's still a big gap. However, and again, to enlighten it a little bit, I mean, sometimes these institutional traditions are, I think, a pain in the neck. Why, after there has been no inflation in major economies for 20 years, and why, if the nominal zero interest rate bound is such a problem, is 2% nominal inflation still considered by most central banks a kind of permanent, reasonable, desirable target. I mean, I think if we took 100 unideological, centrist, well-trained macroeconomists and asked them, what is the ideal inflation rate for the next five years in Europe, European Union, or let's say in the Eurozone, I don't know, it, I'm, I can't prove it, but they would probably say three or three and a half percent. Right. Olivier Blanchard was not far from it. Yep. But tradition, you know, you can't say it because it's kind of so, it's considered so wild. So some of these institution traditions may have to change. Yeah. But on the other hand, the democracy and the, you know, these, these are very important things. I'll tell you one quick story here, which is very important. I won't name the name. The Greeks suffered tremendously. I know Greece very well because I, I have been in Greece every year for the last 15 years, no interruption, sometimes twice. I have very good close Greek friends. I interact with them. Um, the babysitter of my first eldest son was a Greek student who then became Minister of Economy later. And, oh. and um, <laughs> I mean, this was not the influence of my little, <laughs> you know, <laughs> four-week son. But I once asked in an email one of my very smart Greek friends, why, after all of this, I personally think they should stay in the euro. Mm -hmm. That's a different matter. But why does the majority of Greeks want to stay in the euro? And I was having all kinds of debates with Joe Stiglitz, who, was com who, thinks, who think, thought they were completely all mad. And, you know, I got a one-line answer. Because we do not want our doors to ring at night, at midnight, and be arrested. Ultimately, that's why we want to stay in the Eurozone. Yeah, this is what people often forget, that uh, the EU is, and the Euro is, above all, a political project. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why institutions, democracy, the quality of democracy, these are things where the convergence may not be quite as easy as I may have thought myself some years ago. Let's move to another easy problem, uh, inequality. Um, as you said, uh, this is really the discussion of the moment and has been for some time. Uh, it's also something that we increasingly look to to explain uh, what we see around us in politics. Um, the, uh, I wonder if, if you look out from, from here, from this stage, and, and do, do you think anyone, do you think we're getting a, governments and institutions are getting a grip on the problem or, or are starting to 
to address the problem, or is it still just a, an earnest conversation that we're having? I think the conversation has picked up steam. I think analysis has picked up steam. Inequality has, of course, very many different definitions. Exactly what do you mean? Gini coefficient, the top 10%, the top 1%, the, the bottom 40%, you know, all that kind of thing. Branko Milanovic's book, the, his recent Global Inequality book, is a masterpiece of uh, explaining all these various uh, measurements. But I do believe that it has become much more, a much more active discussion in the US, in the world. A more diverse discussion, because a lot of the, particularly the European discussion of inequality, was all about wages and profits. Mm -hmm. The wage share versus the profit share. Well, this is still important, and the wage share has gone down in the US, and the profit share has gone up, and the same in, as has happened in Europe. But it is only one element of inequality. The uh, diversification inside the wage scales and the tremendous salaries. I mean, it's one wonders when one really should call them wages that some super managers make. For that matter, I love tennis. Super tennis stars make um, are partly new phenomenon which reflect you know global scale, winner take all, and all that. What is less understandable, I think the most kind of hurtful about this, is when you saw these financial managers who actually mismanaged their banks and were fired for mismanaging them, getting golden parachutes, in some case reaching $60 million. Now that, you know, even the most, <laughs> I don't know, I don't care about inequality type person cares about. But the problem is very complex. We've started a new project at Brookings with the with a foundation on productivity, growth, and, and income distribution. They're very linked. Mm. It has a lot to do with how technology works. And, and let me give you, just very quickly, because it is one of the articles, and therefore fair game, I guess. The, the, the Uber model, again, a little bit simplified. Yep. Okay? If you have a, a market with anonymous customers, and you're the supplier of a product or of one of the suppliers of the products, there's some kind of an average, there's a demand curve, there's a supply curve, and the price gets determined whether the demand cuts the supply curve, okay? But if you, and this was in the old days, well, you're too young, but <laughs> when I was your age or even a little younger, you know, I basically could buy two airline tickets Actually, only one, because I bought economy airline tickets, except when I graduated to be director at the World Bank or so. But there was only an economy ticket and a business or first class ticket. Now you look and there are A, a B, C, H, F, D, Z, Z, e, type business tickets, type economy tickets. You buy a ticket, you then, your plans change, you want to change it, it costs you half the price of the ticket, right. you know. It's the same thing with Uber in a way. What's behind this is the ability of coders to exactly know their customers. Right. And for those of us who are economists, and none of us, I mean, you know, we, we, I'm not expecting anybody to know that concept, but what is under the supply curve, uh, under the demand curve in economics is consumer surplus is what the consumer would be willing to pay in extremis if he had to or she had to pay the maximum price, okay? And if you have codes that can classify consumers in a very diversified way and differentiate the price of hiring an Uber on a Thursday, busy Thursday afternoon at six o'clock versus at nine o'clock, you know, the prices are different. Yeah. And in a way, it's not bad for consumers because some of the 
lower paying consumers actually couldn't pay the lower price under the older model. But the fact of the matter is that the, the, that the consumer surplus is actually appropriated by the owner of the coder. Right. But you go, you, you go a step further in the book, and the, your provocative title of, of, of this essay is, Is Uber a Threat to Democracy? Right? So, uh, <laughs> which is... Well, sometimes which my is, titles are produced by Project Syndicate. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good one. Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's a good yeah. one. It's a good one. So did more people... Yeah. Well, but, I th um, but you put, you, you put it in the context of French yeah. politics, and it's partly based on Emmanuel Macron's battle with right. with Uber in Paris, and 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 and, and so on. So, I yeah. mean, given that I'm going to be taking Uber home tonight, um, am I going to be threatening democracy along the way? I don't think you will do that. You're too kind a person for that. <laughs> but but the fact is that the manager of Uber in France last year very openly declared that he didn't feel that he had to obey French laws. Now, how that is compatible with any kind of democracy, I wonder, you know. And um, if that kind of evasion of regulation of, I, I, I personally think Uber will improve transportation services and has already mm -hmm. done it in the long run. But it, had, but it has to include a lot of regulation, a lot of taxation. In the beginning, I don't know whether they do now, they, they, don't, they didn't know how to pay VAT tax, for example. Well, you, it's probably the fault of the government because it probably was, wouldn't be so easy to make them put the value-added tax in the, in the code. But, you know, there are many other um, things that the average taxi driver had to do, such as passing all kinds of tax, whether he knew mm -hmm. to get from Z to B, whether he was healthy or she was healthy or whatever. Um, so left to its own devices without market regulatory power of the government, it is not very democratic. Also, and I don't want to overstress the Uber part because there are other things, you know, but it stresses social transition. Right. People who had made their living for 30, 40 years in a certain way and have no easy way to do it differently are all of a sudden faced with a technology which fundamentally makes them unemployed or reduces their wages tremendously. I don't think stopping the technology, stopping the progress is at all the solution. I think what Emmanuel Macron in France, and I have to be careful not to be political, tries to do is to be on the left and yet embrace technological progress, competition, and globalization. Good luck, Emmanuel Macron. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but just like, I mean, on, on this one, I think what triumphed over the dictatorial communist Soviet model in Eastern Europe was not the 1920s capitalism of either Western Europe mm -hmm. or the US. It was the social welfare economy, soziale Marktwirtschaft of Erhard, who was actually a Christian Democrat, and the kind of reforms that, brought, that were brought by American reformers I mean, can you really think of the U.S. economy anymore? I guess some people can, without Social Security, without Medicare, without some of the insufficient but nonetheless important social unemployment benefits and training programs and so on that, that are available. It's not the wild capitalism where everybody fends for himself or herself, yeah. Yeah. that triumphed. Yeah. That would have been good for the Soviets. They could have said, look, but it, it is because capitalism reformed itself and provided a much more humane, and for a long time, yeah. not only humane, but a income distribution growth mechanism where growth, productivity, and income growth and wages were pretty much Aligned. They were growing up together. 
And then something happened, and the two started diverging more and more. And I think unless we find ways to have the gains from growing economies and growing productivity, again, be much more widely distributed, it, democracy will suffer. And that's the kind of underneath, you know, yeah. is it bad for the one? There are various figures, but roughly 90% of all the gains that came after the U.S. overcame its crisis, its financial crisis, 90% went to the top 1%. That's quite a lot. Yeah. I, uh, we promised that we'd talk about Europe, uh, and that was the, that's your final section uh, uh, in, in the book, and then I want to open things up to the floor uh, quickly, and then we'll head off and have some cocktails. But the um, um, one of my favorite titles in here, another one, great titles throughout this book, uh, is in the final section. It's an essay from just a year ago, which I found interesting, actually, in terms of timing. Uh, and it's called E Pluribus Europe, uh, which is, of course, a riff on E Pluribus Unum, the, the great American mantra. Um, can I read you a section? Sure. Um, you write it at one point, yet it is still too early to write off progress toward increased European integration. In fact, when it comes to EU cohesion, more cleavages are probably better than a single divide. I wonder, we've, since then, we've obviously had the, the vote on Brexit. There's a huge discussion happening in Europe now about cohesion and whether it can hold. I wonder how you feel about that now. Two or three points, quickly, hopefully. One, at one point, I was very worried that Europe was splitting between North and South. Mm -hmm. The North, roughly around Germany, that had somehow managed its economy and gained a lot of the benefits from the Euro. Yeah. And the Southern eco economies who had mismanaged, uh, but not only because of their own fault, because they could borrow at incredibly low rates and generated tremendous housing booms in places like Spain. And that all of this would become a, a, a south-north divide. Right. And you know, in game theory, there are some theorems that if you have N players and you have primary allegiances of players to one or the other policy, you don't get consensus. So some disagreements on immigration, for example, where some eastern countries uh, have different views and some uh, British, British uh, would have some different views, that essay was written mainly with the point that when you want N players to cooperate, it is not generally a good idea to have a bipolar right. distribution of choices. And I think that may still be true, although the immigration vehemence with which the Eastern Europeans have um, um, approached the immigration issue challenges me a little bit on that, I have to admit. But if you allow me, since time is going on, or do you want to... Keep, go for it. It's, okay. it's your party. It's yours also. It's ours. Um, there's one thing that I've written about from David Cameron's European Spaghetti Ball, mm. which was actually my invention, not Project Syndicate, which was his major speech on Europe. Jack Bagwadi may claim some. Uh, oh, really? I see. Okay. <laughs> Maybe great mind. But I remember choosing that title myself. <laughs> so, um, in, in my view, there have always been two Europes. The British and some others, most Scandinavians, I would say, right. don't feel the emotional uh, attachment to ever closer union. British were not, they were suffered from the word terribly. They were not occupied like the French. Um, and they also ha didn't have like God knows how many wars beforehand 
eating each other up. The German and the French are very special there they, mm. in terms of having destroyed each other. They have uh, a special know, relationship. They, were, they have a special dis destroying relationship there. Um, and I've always been very interested to see. I was a member of the European Convention, by the way. <laughs> Don't ask me how. As a Turk, I got in there. <laughs> but there was a time when Turkey was supposed to be a member of the European coming member of the European, and I was a full member of the European Convention yeah. in, the, in the European Parliament. But um, the ever closer union thing never quite appealed to the Brits. And I also, when I look at TV, Angela Merkel, biggest European country now, you know, German flag, more nationalism in Germany now, unfortunately. Mm. But there's another flag behind her when she addresses her citizens. It's always the European flag. Right. Same for Italy. Same for Spain. Same for France. You never have seen a British prime minister addressing the British people behind a British flag and a European flag. I think it represents something real. We don't have time to explain what all the things that may be yeah, behind it. Yeah. You know. But it's real. However, that does not mean that Europe has to eject Britain. And I'm not at all one of those who... Some French were very adamant you know, when they... When the Brexit vote passes, now we have to punish them. I don't know how, how they were going to punish them, but anyway. <laughs> They've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I've always felt, and there is now a paper by, f by five prominent European politicians and economists that just came out. And it is very close to two Europes in one paper. I've always felt there was one Europe with Britain, with Sweden, I was hoping with Turkey, and interestingly, the new European paper includes Turkey. Hmm. Interesting fact, encouraging fact. But that there would be two circles, two Europe's in that one Europe, not two speeds. That's different because the two speeds means that you know you will catch up with the other one. Where. Basically, the Eurozone countries still, despite all the problems, go for ever closer union, mm. particularly since they have chosen a common currency. And as an economist, once you've got a current currency, you've got a central bank, you've got a banking system, you have to have a fiscal system. Not all details. You have to have a fiscal framework. Right. You cannot run has never been done and never anybody has shown me how it could be done to have a common currency without a common fiscal system. That doesn't, that, that doesn't necessarily mean handouts. Yeah. Risk sharing, you know, mutualization and so on. At the same time, you can't, and that would be European law. I'm not a lawyer and the lawyer catch me sometimes in various ways. But there's, there's a, established European law, European Parliament, then you can have another Europe, which is also Europe, right. which has a grand bargain and grand partnership with the first Europe, which is led by the U UK as the most important country, which insists on being, and rightly so, a full member of the, common, of, of the single market. If it does that, it has to pay something to the European budget, how much they can negotiate, but that's not the end of the world. Yeah. It, it must be part of the European defense, foreign policy, climate policies, and I think there's nothing incompatible there. The thing which is more tricky, but which some of the continental Europeans are now able to accept, because in a way it's more linked to this absence of the flag thing, is that the migration rules can be different without undermining the, no the notion of the single market. Hmm. So two Europes in one. 
I had hoped that it could happen without Brexit. Right. And I personally feel nobody will ever know, so it's one of these easy statements to make, that if that had been put in front of the people, maybe Brexit could have been avoided, but who knows. But yeah. it's, it can still be done. It doesn't really matter that much. It would, would be based on intergovernmental law, right. a partnership, whereas the European Union would be based on European law right. and more democratic law. I think you've just set the stage for a very fascinating discussion with Theresa May next time she's in Washington. Um, I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, shall we open it up to the floor sure. and just see if there's a, a, a few questions here? Why don't we take them in, in, in a group of, of two And I want to recognize Mr. Bivings, right? And Mrs. Bivings, your daughter, Jordan, was a major help in turning this disparate set of articles without changing them into an actual book. So uh, thank you. Well done. Yes. Uh, we've got one question here and then one right at the back. Start. If you just identify yourself and, and keep it. Brief. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I cannot wait to read your book. I have a question. I think the most difficult problem we face globally is something called jobs. And if people don't have jobs, they don't have a sense of identity, a sense of worth, and, I, and our whole focus economically is to be more productive, which means to put people out of work, as best as I can tell. So if you can tell me how we deal with that, I do recommend to everybody you read a book called The War on Jobs, which is written by Jim Clifton from the Gallup poll. Jim Clifton. Mm -hmm. But it is... I, don't, I have no idea how to address that problem. So if you can tell us how we can do it, you will make my life less anxious. Oh, <laughs> that's something I would like to share with you, <laughs> like, less anxious. <laughs> Let's take the question at the back uh, sure. quickly, and then we'll come back. Um, Carol Graham, Brookings. Uh, uh, this is kind of related to that question. And Kamal, I, lo I love your game theory um, analogy. But I guess what's overlaid on maybe a more positive view of Europe is a completely bipolar relationship between winners and losers that crosses not beyond Europe and crosses the US. And I know you've thought about the losers a lot. But I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how some of the whole debate over Europe is really just an overlay or a victim of the sort of winners versus losers divide in this new economy that you're writing about. Uh, should we take those two? Okay. Jobs and winners and losers. Two huge questions, obviously, and only simple and insufficient answers are possible, unfortunately. But, you know, the jobs thing, I'm facing myself now. I'm almost 68. And my dream would be to work less, but to still work, do interesting things, but not to be forced to work 60 hours a week, which more or less is what I'm working now, and which I have to work because my other friends who are with me in the same boat, they don't have, I mean, legally, we, have to, we can work less. But on weekends, you know, on holidays, we work. And so a big challenge on this working issue is... Yeah, well, that, that is true. That is true. Good point. But, so, no, but, but there is a point which, you know, Keynes's, Keynesian prediction for the grandchildren, when, when he said, in 1930, we can construct a world where, on average, people work much less and are happier because they have more time for health, for other activities they like, for traveling, for human interaction. Hopefully it's not just going to be interaction with machines, but human interaction. And so we have to organize the work in such a way that that becomes possible. After all, work has declined on average, you know, from the bad days of the mid-1900s where people, everybody was working 
particularly the not rich, <laughs> not skilled, were working so hard. So there is an element, of course, in terms of inequality, of skills displacing people because they don't have the skills. But in some sense, there may be an answer, at least a long-term answer to that, through reskilling, training, a new type of education, special programs, investment in these people. After all, skills are acquired, mostly, not all. So it is a very important program, uh, pro problem and program, but it, I, I can somehow see an, an approach, you know, massive education, skilling, learning, and taking some patience with people who are not immediately there, giving them... Who pays for that? All that education. Those who get $80 million golden parachutes when they mess up their firm. Roughly. And, a, and a bit of apple, probably. <laughs> but where I have less of a kind of answer, in a sense, is how to build a society, maybe where work is almost redefined. In other words, where, you know, what we call working 60 hours is maybe, maybe not all work. And, and where other things are very highly valued also, taking care of older people, which is very, very necessary, taking care of um, the environment, um, engaging civically, so socially, engaging in issues that divide society. These are not things that maybe will you know, big, be big money winners but they're hugely required. I mean, think of all the old people any society will have to take care of in the next 30, 40 years. And it's, the it, young children. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, at least the young children hopefully will have parents. And the winners and losers? How do we move away from that? Okay, and the winners and losers. Well, the winners and losers, um, I think... It has to happen at two levels, if you like, the primary level and the secondary level, or the primary level being making sure that at the beginning of the race, so to speak, and I don't really like the word race, but, you know, it is kind of a race, people have close to equal opportunities that they can get in schools which are roughly of equal value, that they can have a social milieu, an urban environment, which helps them, nurtures them. That, that is not taxes. That, that is not the government. You know, it, it is society and the productive apparatus building it that way. I mean, there are, of course, resources involved there. So I think that is very important. Education still is a huge challenge. And having to borrow God knows how much for, for college is, I think, just not acceptable. I was, went to the London School of Economics as a non-British citizen, of course, many years ago. And my tuition for the year was 280 British pounds. It was at that time, I think, something close to $1,500. I mean, so, you know, the travel we've, we've undertaken since that time is, is amazing. So at the end of the day, um, the social essence of a community has to be reaffirmed. And of course, the big, big challenge is not to destroy incentives and, and, you know, not to make it a society where people just get rents, grants, wages without, without working. So there is that balance. But that balance was kind of found in the 60s and 70s and is what ended the challenge of the Soviet Union. I mean, may, maybe not in America, but in the wide world, 
outside the U.S., because the U.S. was the leader of the free world, and rightly so. And it saved the world from Hitler in the, first, in the Second World War. But, you know, a huge majority of French, of Turkish, of Italian, of Arabs, of African, of Latin Americans, in those years, were convinced that socialism was going to win out. It didn't because capitalism built a social capitalism, a social way of doing things that made it a superior system. But it was a national system. Most of these systems were very national. The big problem we have now, and of course the Apple tax case in Ireland is a, is a good example of that, is how to build the tax base, the revenue base, and the, and the cohesion base, and that's important because I'm going to come back to my first point here, that makes that possible. Because we may face a technical solution. I mean, the technical solution to the Apple case is not that difficult, I think. You know, and it's, it's a pretty fit, straightforward case. The aid to create jobs to a particular firm is not allowed under EU law. Ireland has the right to have a 12 and a half corporate tax rate, but it has not the right to make a deal with a particular firm to allow it not to pay that in, in, in exchange for certain actually murky things. Okay? And by the way, on the US side, the, the, the situation is that the US can, if the US claims that as a US taxpayer, it, you know, there are tax treaties. And Ireland and the U.S. can figure out yeah. how to devise the tax rate. It's not very complicated. But for it to be realized, this is where we come back to the beginning. We have to have not just the EU flag. <laughs> we have to f have the, the world flag behind us. <laughs> and some kind of will make it work. And I think in the environment, what happened in Paris, in many cases one sees that. I've seen it, by the way, in Switzerland a lot, where the Swiss hate when other people tell them what to do. Because they're very <laughs> independent. We, we all hate that. But when it comes to engaging socially and helping others, they're one of the more generous people in the world. So I think that's where the, you know, the, 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 the matter is somehow. I don't think it will be re, 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 I mean, solved soon. But do, if you have a chance, read Stefan Zweig. Because you know, it, it, it's a very relevant book. It shows the danger and the catastrophe that can happen if we don't pull together and stop it from happening. Kamal Dervish, thank you very much. We don't have the world flag behind us, but we do have the Brookings flag uh, this evening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks a lot. <laughs>